Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode. Hopefully uh, my voice is loud and clear. I wanted to speak about, um, <clears throat> to dive into the episode, I wanted to speak about how, well the title is Hacking uh, the Cyberspace Culture with Natural Imagery. What I would say I'm thinking in some sense how we as human beings will end up in a sort of unique future event, a unique event in our future. And then <coughs> we as a retaliation, as a potential response to this event, this title of this up the title of this today's episode will kind of relate. So, and um, of course also in the, su in the subtitle I've written, Backup Systems for the Cyberborn. The Cyberborn is a concept that I'm using for the first time here in this episode. Anyways, uh, currently uh, on this planet of ours, we're considering 4.5 billion years of biological evolution so far. So after 4.5 billion years of evolution, <coughs> an object has become a subject to itself and so not only do we have access to a physical real natural world but humanity is moving towards the direction where <coughs> you can say we're creating our second collective simulation inside the world what that means is first there was the world then there is the second world, which is the world of language we collectively all connect to. <clears throat> the third world is going to be cyberspace. And I would say the fourth world would be a world where it's, it doesn't have anything to do with what's in this space. So a fourth... Uh, So pretty much, <clears throat> let's, okay, here, I'll say it like this. Let's, let's even take a yogic approach. The yogis uh, saw samsara, the concept of samsara. They saw reality in some sense being a simulation. So we have a physical simulation and a simulation of objects. <clears throat> we have a simulation of subjects. And then we have a simulation which is in between. Because cyberspace would mean we are entering our imagination. And by the way, I forgot to mention this. Um, I am predicting the the first uh, cyberspace child, <clears throat> the first human being, human child to be born in cyberspace, oblivious of its biology in the year one thousand. Uh, sorry, not in the year. Um, in hundred twenty years from now. That means potentially in the year one thousand one hundred forty-one. There may be the first child born, and this child is born into a cyberspace reality, and in some sense the person doesn't enter reality, out, doesn't step outside of cyberspace. You know guys, I wanted to share with um, the listeners something I've perceived in my inner realms <coughs> about the future. Oftentimes in these Mr. Within talks, what I do is I look at a moment in the world and then I play around with its speed. And uh, when, it, when the speed of the moment slows down, the past is defining the present. When the speed of the moment increases, the future is defining the present. Uh, 
I don't know when I got this imagery for the future. Uh, I don't know if it was during a mis one of these talks I was giving or it was at some other moment, but at some point in my psychology, <clears throat> I saw an inner event and I saw the future, I think way past even 120 years from now. And what I saw, what I fathomed, you know, <clears throat> not even as a sort of absolutist reality, but just as a probability. I saw that in the future, we're going to reach a point where cyberspace technology is going to be more interesting to some people than physical reality. <clears throat> and we're seeing symptoms of that currently as human beings are becoming more technology dependent in how their behavior happens throughout the day. Back in the day, people were fascinated on, on um, going on an airplane. Nowadays, if there is no Wi-Fi on the airplane, like everybody freaks out or something. So we cannot ignore that there is a sort of uh, technological symbiosis going on with nature. The vision, <clears throat> the playful inner vision probability I saw of the future was that all those people, pretty much the species is going to realize human beings don't want to uh, live in the physical world. They want to live in cyberspace, but they have a biological body. I pretty much saw that in the future of humanity in our skies there will be giant uh, horizontal uh, rectangular uh, ships uh, or buildings, flying buildings, whichever way you want to see it. <clears throat> and inside those buildings there's going to be pods for humans. Humans are going to be living out their life in cyberspace. So imagine, I'll give you an example, imagine you're a cigarette smoker, okay, you're, you're someone who's a smoker. <clears throat> you know that the smoking has consequences now and let's say you're someone who you in some sense want to continue smoking or in some sense you're continuing <clears throat> in the future you would have the option of literally going into cyberspace and the body goes into a sort of pod with a unique fluid that in some sense heals the body so pretty much in the future <clears throat> minds can be living on earth without actually the body living that's going to be the implication of cyberspace human beings who look at life and if life is meaningless doesn't make sense to them in the future way in the future they can have an option of just going and living in cyberspace and they pretty much get a second life <clears throat> what do I mean by a second life? That means imagine someone's mind into the cyberspace reality where they are a king of a kingdom back in medieval times. <clears throat> this person, imagine, had a, you know, very, you know, uh, let's say the person felt inferior in the real world, so they wanted to go into their own cyberspace realm to feel superior. The person can stop, uh, pretty much go into, again, one of these uh, pods in the future, <clears throat> and they start living a cyberspace life. So in 10 years of life, they will potentially experience 100 years of life in cyberspace. After 10 years, whatever happens in cyberspace, they die in cyberspace and wake up back in the biological uh, natural universe. So, this is all to suggest that in the future, um, cyberspace is going to become a more intimate part of our lives. And now, <clears throat> what I'm trying to say is that let's imagine that human beings, the reality, like uh, think of it this way, cyberspace is digital reality. <clears throat> Real space, like in, in where we are, where I am right now giving this talk, you know, this is a natural reality. The cyberspace reality is between the most unnatural and the natural. It's kind of the middle way. You could say cyberspace is like the socialism. <clears throat> uh, it's just like how socialism is in the political spectrum. You know, that means one side wants the people to have the power. One side wants the authorities to have the power. One side is in the middle. You know, so I would say cyberspace would be a domain of life where it's as if um, pretty much we are interacting with our imagination and for the first time we can experience our imagination. Right now I can for example close my eyes and imagine myself 
you know, uh, standing up. I'm sitting down on a chair, but I could close my eyes and imagine myself standing up. Now, in the future, in, inside cyberspace, if a person stands up, there you pretty much experience your imagination instantaneously in, in a very real fashion. The issue is that as human beings choose to enter an artificial world where their free will is more like a god than the creation of god, Pretty much the future generations may forget nature. Imagination may become the dominant force of reality and then we will ignore our biology. Imagine you <coughs> being a biological human being born on earth but since birth you have been put into a simulation, right? So the biological body is growing inside this pod, inside this capsule, imagine. <clears throat> and so imagine even right now, it would be equivalent to something like this, where uh, right now I was born in 1991. And uh, <clears throat> in these 30 years of life, uh, it would be as if if, I, if something suddenly happened and I, I exited the realm, like my time was up in the biological realm, imagine I wake up and I see I'm actually like a 15 years old in another biological simulation. <clears throat> Not another, inside a biological reality. So what I'm saying is that in the, f the future generations may forget cyberspace is real. <clears throat> and believe it or not, when you look at Vedanta, when you look at yoga, when you look at the Patanjali Yoga Sutras and the Vedas, you see the most fascinating thing. You see that the earliest yogis, the ancient uh, wisdom traditions, they were trying to escape the world as if they knew reality was a simulation, but we didn't. That means imagine tomorrow there comes the cyberspace reality, everybody forgets about the outer realms and they go inside this digital inner realm. When they go inside this digital inner realm, uh, imagine they have kids inside of cyberspace and those children do not know if they are inside a natural world or an unnatural world, right? But we who entered into the simulation know. So I would say it seems <clears throat> that really what we third is a sort of um, sim simulation of singular worldhood. And just like how we're natural beings in the future, we may forget that we're natural. We may find ourselves in cyberspace and be like, yo, is the, was the earth ever natural or was it cyberspace from the beginning? And in order to create a sort of backup system, so our future great, great, great grandkids are not going to be <clears throat> uh, kind of suffering in cyberspace, I thought that cyberspace has to mimic as much as possible natural reality <clears throat> that means imagine some of the top dogs in the tech sector imagine the most influential um, companies and in technology that in some sense have a power over cyberspace's emergence for the collective species I would say there needs to be a law passed down that in some sense, if there is cyberspace reality, it should try to mimic as much as possible nature. <clears throat> and it must in some sense, like there should be giant teams of people trying to see how we can make, you know, the experience of a tree in cyberspace be equivalent to the outer realms. <clears throat> Let me tell you why. Because the world can forget it was natural in cyberspace. But in, in real life, we cannot forget the world is natural. 
you know, in cyberspace, it would be as if truth's dreaming. That means if, if you're a natural biological being and you experience your psychology and conscious in, in cyberspace, you are like, like a, a natural truth is hidden inside an uh, unnatural truth. You know, I thought about how in the world currently <clears throat> we have companies that are destroying forests in order to build buildings or uh, where they where trees once stood. And so we are actually uh, destroying nature to build the artificial. You know what it is? We are recycling a natural, simple world for an unnatural artificially complex one and the way society has has been designed is that the wound is too deep <clears throat> that means in 2000 in 2021 i will simply say it's the year it's the year that human beings have already decided they will enter cyberspace it can't be ignored We need to have uh, pretty much in cyberspace, game, the gaming industry is going to tap into it first. What that means is that people are going to enter cyberspace to experience uh, a different sense of a world. Like right now, imagine people can't experience anti-gravity, <clears throat> but imagine in the future you just uh, put on these virtual reality goggles or some sort of advanced technology and you're in a reality where you can fly. You can legit fly and you are ignorant of the outer realm experience because the technology is over your eyes so in some sense you are you know it's like they say it's the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality virtual reality is another world is a world is, a, is is you're able to engage another world augmented reality appears like another world but it is not another world i'm pretty much thinking right now i am you know breathing through the philosopher archetype and I was thinking in the future, in cyberspace, imagine children are born, <clears throat> these human beings, and they become uh, philosophers in cyberspace. And when they become philosophers in cyberspace, they will ask, what is the world? Where am I? All the questions I am now asking about a natural reality, <clears throat> there's a huge chance they will ask it in the future inside cyberspace in order to give them freedom just like the ancient yogis <clears throat> you know gave a sort of connection to the uh, pre-material dimensions of humanity I would say we have to give it we have to start writing books about the nature of reality we have to pretty much there has to be programmers who are programming nature in cyberspace. This would be equivalent to, <clears throat> let's say somebody's a programmer making a video game as much as closely related to, as, as close as possible to nature.
or it could even be as simple as someone sharing wallpapers of nature <clears throat> that means when I give these talks I go to this wallpaper site and there's pretty much random wallpapers there and I choose a wallpaper <clears throat> a lot of the wallpapers are about nature scenery that I've never seen before personally like sunset sunrises and you know every time I see a picture of nature in cyberspace it makes me feel as if like <clears throat> it gives me a nostalgia for the world you know so somebody sharing natural imagery in cyberspace <clears throat> will become a sort of profit for those who in some sense will forget nature in cyberspace you know we think there's gonna be a war with nature and machine, with nature and technology, they're gonna have the battle. But let me tell you, they're not gonna have a battle. Technology has already uh, disguised itself as nature. So people will instantaneously accept future technology. There's no way you can escape it. And when I say there's no way you can escape it, I mean as a physical, biological, elemental entity, we cannot escape it. But as a mind, we're actually never in a physical reality that can be entrapped in cyberspace. So consciousness is actually like a two-sided coin where one side is unconditional, the other side is conditional. So it's as if my attention to existence right now, when I look in front of my eyes, it's as if my eyes are a lens and these, this lens filters, you know, let's say the reality's design. But if I begin treating my biological existence like the ancient yogis, if I begin treating my biological existence like a simulation, then I will identify with a presence of attention that has nothing to do with the biology. In the same way, the future generations may identify with a presence that has nothing to do with technology. You know, it's like the mystics were trying to hack, or I shouldn't say hack, they were trying to bypass the simulation of reality, elementally. The future generations will try to bypass uh, the illusion of reality digitally. So that means, <coughs> Uh, the periodic table imagine you're inside imagine every person on the planet their head is connected to a cyberspace collective cyberspace simulation and everybody's living uh, inside uh, inside a simulation of the earth And if everybody's living inside the simulation of, of the Earth, imagine inside a cyberspace reality, <clears throat> you have a chemistry teacher. And this chemistry teacher comes and says, the world is made of atoms. The world is made of uh, the periodic table. But this is the teacher inside of cyberspace, inside the classroom in cyberspace. And imagine the student has somehow, through some experience in life, whether in quotations, cyber spiritual or, you know, or natural spiritual, let's say unnatural spiritual and natural spiritual it's like imagine being a person that knows that reality is a digital cyberspace simulation but inside the cyberspace simulation you have to act as if there's no such thing as an outer reality this is what uh, materialistic perception or a, 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 a strategy of <coughs> uh, of of the mind's approach to matter you see matter is the walls of the simulation of an unknown moving subject. You know, personally, I am 
more of a you know I'm more interested in metaphysics and philosophy but I remember hearing something uh, noticing something uh, that's going on in society that shocked me <clears throat> you know usually when we think of the archetype of the scientist we think of, of the kryptonite of religion as if, as if through the simplicity of the scientific method we are having an experimental sensory acceptance of reality <clears throat> but I realize that it's like guys this is believe it or not something that's going on there is a lot of scientists uh, and I wouldn't uh, on some level you can't call them true scientists but on another level you can they're, they're technically scientists <clears throat> who are religious and I was like whoa 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 what does that mean how can we have a religious scientist you know and you know what I realized I realized the person was behaving like a scientist up until the, the, the experience of the laws of nature. What that means is, imagine you're a scientist and you're like, all right, we find ourselves in a universe, there's four major forces, there's electromagne ele electromagnetism, there's gravitational, there's the strong nuclear, weak nuclear. And so, what this means is that the scientific mind can only be as scientific in describing, in the descriptive domain, right? We conduct an experiment <clears throat> and we, uh, 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 in some sense, articulate the laws of nature from it, correct? But now, if somebody was to say, why are the laws of nature the way they are, whatever amount of experiment we do, uh, we cannot explain why they are the way they are, we can just explain how they are. So science is a method that is, in some sense, um, has explanatory power in how the world is working, but in why the world is working, there is no causal image we can ascribe, right? So it's as if the laws of nature were already there to a degree where certain minds in intellectual circles are like, yo, is the universe infinite? Are we hallucinating our temporality in it just because of an association <clears throat> of, of attention with the body? Or is there something else? So the religious scientist, I was like, what kind of worldview does this person have? And the religious scientist is hilarious. <clears throat> it's as if you're a scientist up to the laws of nature. How the laws of nature came about is, is God did it. That means to a religious scientist, God made science. You know? <clears throat> that means there are scientists who believe God made science, science, uh, science and there are scientists who believe that man made God. <laughs> So pretty much the world is divided between those who feel God made man and man made God and those who are like, yo, are we still talking about this? To me, because there is language war, because there is the conflict of uh, beliefs trying to uh, entering a sort of hunger games, let me tell you, there has never been an ideological system. There has just been an organism that uh, ha uses a method. That means to me, <clears throat> it, it's as if um, rationality and irrationality are both methods. There is even irrational methods to doing something, you know? <clears throat> in a lot of domains of human psychology, we see this. Even in the, in, you can say in the psychology of uh, when people first meet each other their impressions are artificial so they manipulate each other's impressions until the person knows the other person and eventually the true selves can engage you know some people are very i would say uh, confident in their own eyes maybe 
and it could be that they are bypassing the artificial simulations of nature that means there could be people in society right now who actually are not living as a social animal they're not living as a sub identity of as part of a system they are actually living in their first experience <clears throat> you know there is something called um, Aristotle called this first uh, cause philosophy if I remember correctly and what he meant that the first before philosophy there was a sort of religious relationship with divinity that means we are an experiential creature this experiential entity in its biological body has found a way to generate sound as it generates sound it remembers its sound that means every word I'm saying I know the image before I'm saying it even after I say it another image evokes I know that image as well so we are literally a creature that is making noise and then treating that noise based on different intensities <clears throat> that means we're using sound we're pretty much we took sound we took an outer realm object that has no language connected to it and we created language through inner symbolism <clears throat> so that means in the inner realms we have a symbol in the outer realms the mouth is making a noise in the outer realm excuse me in the, uh, the, um, the, uh, between the inner realms and outer realms the the body is generating noise from the voice box <clears throat> and in the outer realms in some sense it is just an object so our mind is not actually living in a physical world the mind is noticing objective geometry and bringing it into its own sub self subjective reality what that means is our bodies are living inside our minds our minds are not living inside our bodies as traditional thought suggests and let me tell you this is why everybody is moving towards simulation theory why because it's the uh, what else can a temporary being do being a temporary creature on earth is a simulation <clears throat> you know i could right now try to act as immortal as i want you know but i'm a temporary body you know every day that goes by it's as if the person's making a decision do you want to live as a mind do you want to live as a body <clears throat> and most people actually have uh, are somewhere in between a sort of roller coaster right but this is what happens when uh be because i'm telling you sometimes i I feel I'm uh, I may be the first in a certain I sometimes I feel an exp like an explorer in these talks and as an explorer the explorer that goes to a new land usually will meet challenges that there is no preparation for so one thing in my attempt to live more as a mind than a body is it is as it's as if I have realized <clears throat> uh, civilization doesn't have the proper balance yet the kind of society we have built keeps us too preoccupied in in biological desire but really the mind is not just biological the mind is attributeless ladies and gentlemen the mind is not an object so it cannot correlate to anything <clears throat> you know that means we can say the brain is an object but then what is the brain doing what the brain is doing its effect is being mind but to the met to the metaphysicist rather than the physicist the 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 mind is in some sense the brain is the effect of a non-physical cause so there are people on the planet being like all right non-physical first then physical and then there are people who are like physical first then non-physical believe it or not in in even trying to draw parallels between the big bang theory <clears throat> and religious ideology the the abrahamic origin story of the world and guys the reason i talk about religion is because <clears throat> not only have i lived through that archetype and in some sense moved beyond it but i have also noticed that a lot of the population will in fear try to hang on to ideology because it will try to hang on to ideology the ideology that is around it becomes its truth I would tell you that the mind to me my inner realms it's not a cyberspace simulation but it's it's literally like a geometrical simulation that means imagination is like a preview imagination is a prototype <clears throat> of cyberspace 
and anybody who can stop uh, for like this is meditation pretty much you stop the movement in your outer realms and then your inner realms movement defines the meaning of the attention so you can say there is no such thing as uh, uh, you could say sanity and insanity there is just 8 billion creatures that have their attention divided between their inner realm some people they're way more in their inner realm than their outer realm so their truths do not correlate to physical sensory perception first <clears throat> you know and uh, I'll probably speak about like um, psychological illnesses in another episode yeah, for example the fragmented psychology for example what people mean when they speak about uh, schizophrenia you know and even how we would perceive schizophrenia if we realize that the simulation of the consciousness is alone that means we are thinking that people are born in society and they can understand the society but believe it or not we are 8 billion creatures with different DNAs just like we can't fit in 8 billion different DNAs into the same type of educational system there is no way we can fit 8 billion to uh, a, we can have 8 billion human beings being normal it is impossible both genetically and epigenetically <clears throat> that means culture is changing too much to be able to control anything really what life is or any sort of control one can think of is it's the same type of control as surfing a wave or riding a horse You know, I feel that all human beings go through a cycle of getting exposed to an inferiority complex and to a superiority complex. <clears throat> and this means that certain experiences in life imbalance our psychology, but we cannot ignore that our decisions are being the memories that create our future self. That means if I <clears throat> speak rudely, I have created a rude memory for my future self. If I do something cruel, I have created a cruel archetype for my future self. Just like how right now I look at my past and I'm like, yeah, I remember what I did tomorrow. So yesterday is being today's memory. So right now is being tomorrow's memory. Right? So this is why mindfulness in Buddhism, they talk about it. Now, if you can be selfless, this means you access a memory field without being identified with the memory field then you become a very advanced communicator because you are not trying to communicate there's no such thing as communication there is nature happening and there is a conscious opportunity of expression that means i would say i am i don't prepare for these talks i find an opportunity to talk about something and then I talk about it and the opportunity is like a potential that is already there <clears throat> right and so the future generations they may not have access to probabilities of remembering that life is natural that means what is there to say that like who is there to say I mean I'm just thinking right now if this world was an illusion how would we respond to it and if cyberspace was an illusion, how would the future generations respond to it? And if beyond cyberspace there were simulations, how do we respond to it? I would say we have no method of response. Why? Because the universe appears infinite. <clears throat> and what appears infinite is not the human being. It's the context where the human being is arising. That means the periodic table is acting like an eternal being that's reincarnating all the time. As creature a Buddhist chemist would totally be like the periodic table is reincarnating as people
Guys, I'm going to give a talk in the future <coughs> titled uh, Reincarnating Periodic Tables in Buddhist Chemistry. And I'll be giving a commentary on uh, pretty much uh, what can, how chemistry through cultural multidimensionality may change. Justin uh, says in the chat section, welcome everyone. Uh, there's six people listening. Um, anybody who wants to ask a question in brackets, write in context too, and then ask the question unless the question is general and any context can apply to it. Justin in the chat section says that makes sense. The mind is not the brain. The mind is its own simulation or the mind is a simulation to both the individuals and the collective. So that's the whole point of the, in quotation, spirituality, <clears throat> you know? What, what I mean by this is that there is a dimension of 100% known phenomenology. This is the physical realm. There's a dimension of semi-known phenomenology and semi-unknown uh, noumenology. This is called the mind. Then there's a dimension of pure 100% unknown noumenology. That means when the world is 100% unknown, you cannot be a physical phenomena, so automatically you have to be something spiritual or metaphysical uh, beyond the sensory domain. <clears throat> that means if atoms are 99.9% .9 empty, then matter is geometry. That means we are pretty much in just a pure geometrical universe. Because we are moving in it through a higher dimension of perception, it feels like physical reality for us. But again, because we have different DNAs, this means every person has to find their own door, which their mind is a key to. You know guys, <clears throat> I'm thinking right now, if like a higher dimensional being, just uh, just like you, how you uh, take out a cat from a box, like you grab the cat from the back of its neck, <clears throat> and you take the cat out of the, let's say the kitten out of the box, for a second I thought, what if a higher dimensional being just took me out of this reality and threw me into cyberspace? How would I try to <clears throat> uh, climb my way out of cyberspace? If I was in a cyberspace reality, first I would question the survival requirement. That means first I would ask, am I an immortal or am I a mortal? Right? If I am immortal, I know that reality is a simulation. If the body endlessly arises, I can say it's a simulation. Right? That means there is a permission for immortality in a cyberspace reality. Imagine the programmer of the cyberspace uh, making himself a god in cyberspace. But now imagine that programmer of the cyberspace reality entering the cyberspace reality and forgetting that he was the creator of the realm. And as he goes on exploring in the world, begins to remember more and more that, uh, uh, or I would say poetically, they were remembering more and more the original Earth. That means there are some people who I would say they believe in heaven, like they're on earth, they're trying to get to heaven. I would say there are some people already in heaven who are wondering how they're on earth, you know.
you know an emotion can make a person feel obligated <clears throat> in remaining as something but I feel that um, pretty much any being who realizes who has, who has experienced beyond the simulation will not have fear so the biggest sign is to know is it possible to find oneself in a unconditional fearless state <clears throat> you know if that is possible When I say unconditional fearless, I mean that means regardless of whatever fear, the fear doesn't relate to the viewer in the moment. That means if you experience something more than human, then the human dimension is not the only dimension because why would the experience be there? You see, it's kind of like saying imagination is not real, but why is everybody having it, you know? So in the chat section, the old currency guy says, I'm just going to accept all the information given to me and use it my best ability to create a better world. <clears throat> I mean, yes, that's the way. That's the, we're on a galactic island. There is no uh, ID. One language is more true than another language. We're using all methods to, in some sense, advance. And advancement means clarity. Advancement means we notice we have blind spots. We look at those blind spots. Those blind spots extend the context of the world as the context of the world extends. Novelty uh, re-enters the system, changing it. Um, Justin in the chat section says question do you mean like spiritual psychology so you know spiritual psychology is I don't want to say it's a redundant term because the word psyche comes from spirit believe it or not <clears throat> right now we are experiencing an analytical philosophical age uh, in uh, the validity of uh, reality through a psychological perspective but the whole study of the psyche came from the fascination of the mind that means really <clears throat> we're not wondering about the philosophy of science but we're also we're, excuse me we're not just wondering about the science of philosophy we're wondering about the philosophy of science as well you know You know, sometimes I find it bizarre, you know, that the theoretical physicist uh, considers parallel universe theory, multiverse universe theory, <clears throat> but when it comes to an ancient transcendental narrative rather than a modern narrative, then the, trans then the transcendental narrative is bashed. You see, guys, the thing you take for face value, you become a fool in, you know? <clears throat> that means if somebody speaks to a person and let's say person A and person B, they meet for the first time and they talk and they're both very nice. If person A and person B both leave that moment thinking that, yeah, person A is such a nice person, person B is such a nice person, they both have been duped because no person is nice or not. Uh, or it's, there is no good and bad. If circumstances are met, people are pleasant. If circumstances are not met, people are unpleasant. You see, <clears throat> there is no absolutism, right? And so it is, it is a tragic thing to deny multidimensionality in past uses of language and then authorize multidimensionality in modern uses of language because mathematics is a language. That means anybody who <clears throat> doesn't treat mathematics as a language is another way to translate the reality, the film of life. It's as if the philosophy of mathematics transcends the human psychology.
Because to me, what seems to be happening is that human beings are fighting for the shape of the world not realizing the world is like is not a photograph it's a film there is no one moment that can capture it all there's no lord of the rings one ring to rule them all one idea ideological system to rule them all <clears throat> you know it's as if um even the religious person i will speak to religious audiences you know um, the religious person looks at a garden and sees wow look at god's creation look at god's creation that God has made a rose, has made a tulip, has made <clears throat> a dandelion, has made so many different kinds of flowers. Now imagine uh, the dandelion being like, no, all the flowers should be the color of the dandelion. The only truth of God is a yellow flower instead of a red flower or a blue flower, right? And then the religions try to reprogram each other, which is impossible. <clears throat> And now this was what happened in the ba back in the day, guys, through where religion was a political movement, right? People don't understand this, you know. Militant atheists, <clears throat> you know, uh, talk about sixth century religion as if, like, look at these savage war, uh, uh, war uh, <clears throat> uh, obsessed people. But I will tell you, th that was the game back then. Back then, it wasn't like you were who were acquainted with one another, accepted each other. Crowds of people who were not acquainted with one another could not accept each other. <clears throat> you see, it was a war over the context of reality, right? But the context of the theological lens is that everything is God's creation. This is why killing is a sin. That means in all religions, that means in all religions, it says killing is a sin, but there is violence in religion which doesn't make sense. Everybody knows in all religions they say killing is a sin. As if God is like, I created you, don't destroy yourself, don't destroy my artwork. You know, it's as if, it, as if the divine will is shouting that in every moment that life uh, breathes, you know, in this realm. <clears throat> and I will tell you, whether a person calls themselves a scientist, a philosopher, uh, a religious person, a spiritual person, let me tell you, dear listeners, it is all ideological costume games. There is just a one-sided spotlight of a viewer. There is just the glow of the mind as the space where being is, and then we move, right? So I am speaking to all those human beings that are willing to step beyond the linguistic simulation. Because the linguistic simulation can enslave man and distract a multidimensional species of its birthright of an advanced civilization. So, Samuel, in the chat section, uh, I would encourage you to, in brackets, type about in context to what? Samuel says, what makes one person different from the other experiences? Question, question. Are we in total control of all the events that occur to us? Obviously not. <clears throat> because if we were in total control, we would be God. Right? And let me tell you what that would mean. That would mean if I wanted it to be night right now, it would instantly be night. Do you see what I mean? Because we can't control in, the, in front of your eyes, you don't have total control of all the events to, that occur but behind your eyes you do that's what i keep saying piloting piloting behind your eyes you're just attention <clears throat> here i'll try an exercise with the audience okay anybody can try this out <clears throat> imagine right now i say imagine you had an orange like the fruit the orange and an apple an orange in your left hand and an apple in your right hand imagine whoever you are listening to me right now just close your eyes and visualize yourself as if your eyes weren't closed and the, the apple is in your hand uh, apple in your right hand <clears throat> and the orange in your left hand okay now here's the thing or here oh, oh, I, I messed up the exercise I'll say it with a different object. Whoever you are listening, imagine right now in your inner realms a penguin with a top hat on. A penguin with a top hat. Okay? Now, 
imagine this tent penguin in a top hat in Antarctica, okay? Imagine a penguin in, in t with a top hat is walking in Antarctica, you know? <clears throat> so, any now, anybody who's done visualizing that, I want you to answer this question. When you visualize the penguin, did you have to visualize yourself first in the inner realms, then the penguin, or did you straight go to visualizing the penguin in your inner realms? You see, you went straight to visualizing the pen penguin. You didn't say first I am in Antarctica, then there is a penguin in Antarctica. Your attention just teleported to penguin in Antarctica moving with a top hat first person point of view. So do you see what I mean? In the inner realms, it's like a double-edged sword. We're in front of our eyes first person, behind our eyes it's first person of an invisible, kind of like an invisible dark room where there is uh, holograms of uh, the outer realm moving in it. That means if a person can close their eyes and they can see an image, how? There was no light entering your eyes. Your eyes were closed. It's memories fascination. So Sam, to answer your question, um, Samuel, we are in control in the outer realms like a candle is in control of the candle flame. That means you, you are like, there's a sphere around you and this small sphere. We are ants. And the cosmos is like hu a human being going to work. The ant can't fathom, <clears throat> you know, the human mind. And so the human being cannot fathom the cosmic mind, but has attempted to and is using a photograph, film, and sentence approach to kind of sentence structure approach to figuring it out. Dear listeners, we all <clears throat> can say that we are living three lives. We can say this. Let me tell you how. <clears throat> One life, we are alone with ourself. It's the life of your self. Okay? Then there is the life where it's self with others in a world. It's not just self in a world. And then there is a life where it's the world regardless of the self and the other. You know, in a book I wrote called The Great Work, I drew a circle <clears throat> and I drew an inverted triangle inside it where the points of the triangle were making contact with the circle. <clears throat> I called one point again the self, the one point much I was looking at life and I'm like, what do I have access to? What is the most basic layout, or I shouldn't say layout, what is the most basic template <clears throat> that the psychology when the person opens their eyes expresses through and pretty much in order to poetically graduate or pilot beyond this earth plane there has to be six uh, check there's like six things to do on a checklist six cultivations you can say you can say this is mr. within's six cultivations of stepping out of any simulation that is yeah, any simulation, I think. So what is it? Keep in mind the imagery of a circle with an inverted triangle inside it. <clears throat> the point of self, the point of other, and the point of all are all connected. This means a human being This means, uh, sorry guys, I'm just changing the music. <clears throat> this means a human being should 
become acquainted with the known self, should cultivate understanding of the known self, should cultivate understanding of the unknown self. Make this a checklist for yourself. Then the second part of the checklist is one has to understand the known other and the unknown other. <clears throat> and lastly, one has to understand the known world and the unknown world and has to come into terms with it. I personally, as a human being, have gone through this checklist. If anybody asks me about a known self, I can share something from my experience. If anybody asks about an unknown self, I can share something experiential. <clears throat> if anybody asks about a, an unknown sense of self, let's say you see a, a person in front of your eyes and imagine you, you see a personality archetype that arises from the collective unconscious inside your sphere of individual inner realm consciousness. You know, it's as if energy is consciousness, to be honest, and energy is laughing, as if when are human beings going to realize they're all made of energy and energy cannot be created and destroyed, and imagine that the soul is just conscious energy. That means the soul is just infinity, infinite transformation. That means earth is a dimension <clears throat> where duality is given an infinite permission. So it is, Earth is an incredible designer's table. <clears throat> it is a designer's studio. I am telling you, this Earth is not the perfect dimension right now for an emotional entity, because if you're emotional, you're gonna be literally as if the gods are grabbing, the t shackling the titans with chains and dragging them all around, titans with chains and dragging them all around the universe. You know? In my uh, talks, poetically, I speak about the lords of karma, but I speak about it poetically. <clears throat> poetically doesn't mean it's true, it just means it's an, it is an imagery-based probability. The lords of karma, the way I became acquainted with them, because sometimes in my life, certain events would take place where I could not understand them. That means the person's behavior with the other person's behavior had nothing to do with them. <clears throat> and um, my behavior in the moment had nothing to do with me. It was as if there was an additional thing in the moment, right? So imagine person A and person B, <clears throat> they're having a conversation. Then person B says some things to person A that, A that are completely outside of the human world context. Like I had an experience once guys which was such a profound experience I don't I guess this may be one of the rare times I speak about it where through somebody else like I was with someone and that person suddenly their personality it was as if their personality went to the passenger seat another personality came through them and told me the simulation is complete literally it was as if something else beyond personality through those who are very easy it's easy for them to be <clears throat> ignorant how can i tell you it's as if we're antennas guys we're antennas this whole time people are like my beliefs though mr within what do i do with my beliefs with my belief systems and disbelief systems i've worked so hard i'd be like it doesn't matter antenna means new moment new image That means the person is trying to come to peace with their past and they're like, wait a minute, what am I doing trying to make peace with the past when we have the idea of something new be meaning completely disconnected with the past? You know, the future generations may start doing such genius uh, decisions in the future. Like right now, I feel like a pilot you know, pilot of a collective sphere of intelligence that have kind of landed in a singular state. It's as if, and there will be so many pilots arriving. I'm pretty much like, sometimes I feel I'm the uh, person who's come here to build the airport um, for, uh, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> the inner realm airport, a sort of archival database of potential uh, archetypal activation. Reality is honestly pretty cool, you know. 
it's as if the person does something wrong and can feel the scolding stare and the scolding gaze of the lords of karma and then a person does something right and they can feel the silent smile of the lords of karma this would, would this in some sense would be another way of saying your conscience universalizes that means the person no longer has a human conscience i'm not talking about intuition conscience is a backup system of the furthest revelation of your simplest nature that means if you were a peaceful child which most human children are just peaceful but it's like they don't know what violence is even <clears throat> you know there can be this argument that uh, a person there's no such thing as good and evil people there's just possibilities probabilities and then there's decision makers that means it's as if there is no good people but there are people who express themselves through good it's like an energy that expresses itself through goodness you know <laughs> where we're like oh my goodness you know such good <laughs> and then imagine there, there are those who are like yo i want to be cruel and chaotic why not i'm here once yolo you know it's like why not be a dictator if you live once you know why doesn't everybody decide to be a dictator suddenly why doesn't everybody decide to dominate the world right <clears throat> do you see so the idea is that because uh <laughs> it's not something that can be controlled the world is bigger than us. That means the world is our elder. The guy in mind is your elder. This is why human beings should not be cruel to nature or the lords of karma intervene. <clears throat> I've had moments where I'll, I'll tell you a situation where I'll tell you the lords of karma intervened. <clears throat> this is in 2010. I don't know if it's 10 or 11. I was in London, Ontario, uh, and I was attending this uh, club. You know, I'm not a, don't, don't think I'm a person who's like, <laughs> who goes clubbing and stuff a lot. You know, I'm a, but I, I went to this incident, to this event, um, this nightclub event. And this fight breaks out, and this is during a time where I was a very egotistical, no, I had no, all the ideas I'm sharing now, I had no idea of them and, and what, at that point. <clears throat> and anyways, long story short, an intoxicated me in 2011 is standing in this line of a nightclub, everybody's trying to go in, the line has these two fences that come up to your shoulder, so in these, it's everybody's kind of in like this kind of fenced hallway trying to go into this nightclub, you know, in the outside, in the street, in the outside of the nightclub venue, you know. <clears throat> And so everybody's in there, the fence, there's fence, a fence up to like imagine your shoulder. And there's a person who, I don't know, um, some sort of argument breaks out. <clears throat> I don't know if it was my own, you know, insecurity that made my ego be loud in that moment or whatever. But it, there's something I had learned in martial arts where they say any time a person's nose, um, flares up that person is getting oxygen there's adrenaline going in their brain and they're about to punch or do something physically violent so i'm in this situation in this nightclub where the person i, I get in a conflict with the person and i can see in the person's eyes he's about to hit me can you imagine you seeing someone's about to hit you and they're not there you know like you this, that's what i mean the nostrils flare up that means if you want to fight really want to fight it's a total different psychological intensity the person like in, inhales to kind of like solidify their strength you know so i see this guy in that instant have his nostrils flare and i hit him i hit him first in that situation the moment i hit him guys before the guy even has a chance to come and uh the fight to become intense right a bouncer <laughs> A bouncer and the person was taller than me by the way <clears throat> that means tall people are a different kind of fighting strategy you pretty much have to cut the tree <laughs> but you know not to make this an MMA discussion <laughs> 
But in that moment, this bouncer comes and grabs me by my hoodie. I don't know how this, how this was even possible, how this guy even did this. From a fence that comes up to my shoulder, this guy, like it was like some next level Navy SEAL thing. This bouncer grabs me by my hoodie, pulls me in a way across the fence where my body doesn't touch the fence. Literally nothing happens. And he, uh, he puts me on the other side of the fence and he, I don't know, it was some next level thing where he's using his knee to keep me down on the other side of the fence, right? At the same time, he's held my hoodie, so my hoodie's over my face, and there's this car's, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the, the Like the um, right front light of the car, of some car or taxi coming through my hoodie as this guy's kind of held me down, you know? And to me, that was such a bizarre thing. That was literally as if like some some karmic mismatching where to me it was I was literally I in my mind I was like okay serious fight you know but out of nowhere I got pulled out of the situation you know and it was weird it was so weird that I, for a second I was like looking at the sky and I was like universe did you just do that you know it was like it was as if you can notice something there you know there's another incident my parents tell me this uh, but uh, I don't have a, I have a very fa faint a vague memory of it evidently when I was like I don't know seven I don't know seven I was very young this is uh, I have a twin brother <clears throat> and um, so what happens is um, in Iran um, I I imagine two twin year old uh, what am I saying twin year old two tw <laughs> two seven year old twins and evidently we had this, um, how can I tell you? A closet was about to fall on me when I was young. And it was because there was this lamp in the back and the lamp kind of pushed the closet. And my mother just sees me pass by this closet and the closet bah, falls right behind me. Do you know? And it was like, I don't know how to, t I don't know how to say it guys. It's like sometimes in life, it's like in a through enough experience you just get a sense like there's something else going on here it's not just all in our control and it's not all out of our control it's as if we are actors in a film and we will be in the realm as long as we're done with our part you know once we're done with our part you can say any being who dies any being they have kind of uh, they they have completed some level of their work here yeah. And I'm sure that there is uh, a strange, I think many people have noticed, uh, young people's karma is strangely authorized and the chill and young people don't realize this. That means it's like a lot of things that... All of life is about how far, not how far we can see, how far all our sensory perception is be, uh, becomes our meaning. Okay, okay, so Ruth says share something interesting in the chat section. Feel free guys to ask questions of any kind just in brackets right in context too. Ruth says I suspect my unknown self is the in caps once removed from this dimension. The one who opens his eyes when I am still dreaming and interprets the real shadows seen through my half opened eyelids as enemies. Okay, only <laughs> that escalated quickly. Yeah. So, Ruth, I will tell you this: there is this. Um, this is a very important story, guys, to know. <clears throat> and um, in India, there is this figure which is seen as the archetype of the perfect man, known as Rama, this deity figure. And so, this person goes to Rama and says, "Rama, why do we have to work for enlightenment?" You know, 
why do we human beings have to put an effort towards conscious effort towards enlightenment? And Rama says, because beings in lesser dimensions, Rama was like an enlightened kind of God conscious individual. <clears throat> deity figure you can even say deity level of individualism <clears throat> and so Rama says beings in lesser dimensions they are too ignorant too lost in unconscious you can say hell loops or unconscious ignorant loops loops of ignorance that they can't even ask the question that means you look at animals they don't care about philosophy they're like where's my food how do I feed my young do you know where do I kind of like bathe myself? Do you see what I mean? Like, like that's what animals are thinking. They're not thinking about the meaning of their dimension. We're the only animal that's doing that. So <clears throat> Rama says lesser beings can't ask the question. And he says beings in higher dimensions, the demigods, they don't need to, they can't ask the question because they're getting so many offerings, they never suffer. Because gods don't suffer, they can never get enlightened. So they remain gods till the end of time. Do you know? It's only in the human dimension where a being can get enlightened. Do you know? Where even a, a demigod can get enlightened. Some people perceive, for example, those those people uh, who suddenly a lot of people like um, uh, let's say let's say like a, like um, <clears throat> um, all those people who are very popular who have like millions of subscribers on YouTube. I would say they are working with a sort of demigod consciousness. Let me tell you why. Because the knowing comes from somewhere else. Because ex experience is like an exploration. So that means there is a previous context where some, a new, new dimension is being added. So once you know the known, you have cultivated the known self. Once you have cultivated the unknown self. Once you have cultivated the known other. Once you have cultivated the unknown other. Once you have cultivated the known world. Once you have cultivated the unknown world. Pretty much all of nature has become just the known and the unknown. Even the connotations we ascribe to chaos, for example, as evil, or the connotations we ascribe to uh, cosmos, to order, <clears throat> that is like good, for example, all of that goes away. Pretty much right now, if somebody was like, hey, Mr. Within, how are you looking at life? I'll be like, I'm looking at an unknown world where every moment my experience of it is a sort of known piloting in it. So I'm pretty much an unknown viewer piloting through a known body in a known world but actually the the self within is unknown and the world the, the outer world is unknown you know that means the world's in quotations within if the world wanted to go within it would in some sense go into an unknown world when the human self goes within we go towards an unknown self but once that uh, <clears throat> uh, the six cultivations are made, then there's only two cultivations, the known and the unknown. Then, once a person under cultivates the unknown, they will be content with knowledge. Knowledge won't burden you. Language doesn't touch you if you're content with the unknown. If you fear the unknown, emotions will uh, simulate you into archetypes, into egoic constructs. So the idea is a non-dual being cannot have, cannot react. It, it can have human psychology, but cannot react to the human psychology. Pretty much unknown experiencer known expert of uh, of an known world of an unknown <laughs> I mean people get the geometry of it by now I think pretty much <clears throat> even in a simpler way what I'm saying is like there's four quadrants to life 
One quadrant, you got to manage your known self. One quadrant, you got to manage your... Uh, one quadrant you got to manage your uh, the known world how you, how you how you understand like the context of the world in a known way then you got to manage the unknown self and the unknown world the unknown self and unknown world are one it's only the known self and the known world that are separate incredibly non dual it cannot be dual the dual is just the basis of the known so you can say physics is duality <clears throat> Metaphysics is non-duality. And I don't know if people know the word physics comes from fuse. Pretty much if pretty much if you want to be an advanced communicator you just like holding the violin you you experience the expressionism of communication throughout the day truth has nowhere to go and the the illusion has infinite places it can go and really we are realizing it's honestly a circle guys as Carl Jung was relaying what the ancient alchemist would say the center of the circle is God and the circumference of the circle is like the world the center of the circle is everywhere and the circumference of the circle uh, if I okay let me see if I'm saying this correctly hold on this <coughs> Carl Jung says God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. By the way, guys, this is a very abstract episode. Anybody who made it through this episode, uh, round of applause for yourself. If we can say cyberspace is <clears throat> disadvantage would be equivalent to the disadvantage of again um, us destroying trees and building buildings it's as if we have to at least uh, either uh, create trees on top of all like oh, there comes this law that forces all buildings to have like trees on the top you know Or, pretty much we either um, bring plant trees or we at least tell people to plant trees, right? And so I would say, I think I figured it out. This, this, the hidden clue for cyberspace culture should be a tree. That means if you find yourself in the future, let's say my talk somehow, because it's connected to cyberspace, maybe you, uh, the people in the future will get, let's say those who are cyber born, maybe they have access to these Mr. Within talks. I would say the archetype of the tree. That means in the future, gener imagine a, a, a civilization inside cyberspace, all the civilization is searching to see if there is a real tree. That means imagine a person in cyberspace being like, all I want to do is feel a, what a natural f tree feels like, you know? And guys, even think about video game psychology, right? The person is, uh, is let's say a person who plays a multiplayer online game, 
<clears throat> that game is like a character and this character has access to this global map this digital map now the person moves the keyboard moves the mouse but the person who is moving the character cannot be the character and so imagine a video game character being like yo who's moving me what is there god is there divinity and the video game character realizing that it is beyond the pixelated realm right so it's beyond the realm of pixels and so i would say if we're in a simulation its truth is beyond the realm of elements that means the physical reality is a liftoff platform. It is not the destination. It is a it is a passage point for a multidimensional, perhaps a multidimensional eternalism. You know, we're reaching an era, uh, not reaching. We are ever since 2020. I declared that we're in the era of advanced communication, and all human beings can very comfortably begin. Uh, sharing their inner realms. It's as if there's a unique authorization in the world, I, feel, I perceive. That means it's as if we went through an evolutionary phase of mastering the objective movement. Now we are going to an evolutionary phase where we got to communicate in ways we have uh, never communicated before in the same way how in the past we moved in ways we had never moved before. And people should not forget that novelty is powerful. Art is the new dimension art is like information from the future and you know uh, uh, any system that is from coming from the past like uh, that, that any idea of uh, is uh, ideas are like from the past you know like I have to use the alphabet and then use the alphabet to fathom words and use all those words to fathom sentences and then use all those sentences to fathom a, a, a film of a, a communication like for those things, right? Anyways, guys, I feel I've shared actually enough. Um, let me see what else I can say about the subtitle. So in the subtitle, I've written backup systems for the cyber, cyber board. Uh, right now, we can act as if we know what the backup system is, or we got to act as if we got to create the backup system. <clears throat> You know, that means there's going to be philosophers in the world who they're going to feel the greatest philosophy is already out there. You know, or there's going to be philosophers who in some sense are going to realize that to, it's like we have to bring in the greatest philosophy. The philo greatest philosophies have not been born yet. The greatest, like everything I'm saying, it's going to be nothing compared to how multidimensional the future is going to be. You know, it, the only thing I feel is going to happen is that in the future, like I don't know how long my talks are going to echo, but in the future... Uh, the people, uh, if they hear these Mr. Within talks, they're going to be like, holy shit, Mr. Within knew that we would be looking at him and seeing his blind spots, you know, <clears throat> because that is the nature of reality, guys, you know, the future generations will see what we cannot see. So our attempt is to see as far as we can, and then we pass the torch to the future generations and we shift it to a different gear of work, different dimension of work. Anyways, guys, thanks for listening. I hope this episode was helpful. Um, in order to care for the cyberborn, we should appreciate and be grateful that right now we're living in an era where we are biological beings. We don't have to be like, oh my God, am I a machine right now? We, like, we don't have to ask that now. 
you know it's a blessing this era we're alive in and this era it requires to be communicated because imagine a cyberspace era uh, a cyberspace culture is going to come in the future and only our communication in cyberspace will be the natural universe that means right now more than ever we need people sharing natural life literally people going in nature and recording themselves talking about how life was in 2021 <clears throat> you know and this will be uh, an incredible backup system approach to the future to the for the minds of those held in cyberspace that means the advanced communicators they in some sense uh, the advanced communicators they care for the great great grandchildren of all human beings but the average person cares maybe for their own grandchildren only like when I look at my grandparents like my grandpa doesn't care about the grandchildren of other people <laughs> he cares for his own grandchildren you know but if you were in a collective being if you were if humanity was your family your grandchildren will be all humanity so guys, um, there seems to be people who uh, have questions. I'll open it up to Q&A for a couple minutes, but the talk is officially uh, is over at this point. And thanks to everyone listening. And when I use the term hacking, I, like, I don't have that technical knowledge of programming. I'm just a philosopher wondering about the programmer being the archetype of a sort of creator of a realm. And so what are the consequences of that for the cultural entity and the social animal? right because cyberspace is going to mean uh, we're going to start living in two worlds it's going to be three worlds we're going to have our imagination <laughs> we're going to have the outer realms and then we're going to have cyberspace cyberspace would be another way of saying we access the unknown world So, Justin, I'm looking at your question. So, are you asking me if inner vision is ether? I would say that this, I will tell you what the Vedas say. <clears throat> the seer, S-E-E-R, the seer <clears throat> of the seen, S-E-E-N, is unseen. The seer of the seen is unseen. Yeah, you're attributeless watcher right now. Your body is in your, in the space of your conscious mind. Yeah, guys, we're more than bodies because we have minds. We're more than minds because we can observe how the mind generates into expressionism. So there's an additional dimension of witnessing before we actually behave. There's an inner, inner, inner rule, you can say. The inner realm. And right now, more than ever, we need explorers of the inner realms, not just the outer realms. And every person on this planet should write a book. That should be the least that people can do. Write a book about the, what their eyes saw that nobody else did. And so the species in the future is going to be like, oh my God, you know, look at all that was happening that we didn't know behind people's eyes. Anyways, guys, I, I feel good about this episode. I'm going to end it off. I'll be on Discord uh, for 10 minutes for those who have questions. For those who don't, um, <clears throat> thank you for listening. And um, as the as as the slogan of Civilization 2.0 goes, and guys, before I end off, there's a quote I've written in the description of this video. It's from Nicholas Negroponte. He says, "This is just the beginning, the beginning of understanding that cyberspace has no limits, no boundaries. That means it's an infinite technology." 
cyberspace would be as if like in 10 years we experienced 1000 years of immortality imagine it could be something like that. it could be artificial immortality at least the experience of what immortality beyond 100 years would feel like so uh, thanks for listening and namaste